like the opportunity for us uh, in the multi-source like to like start conversation and to um not a second oh yeah and uh, that we can also like have these spaces for for exchange ideas uh experiences and so on um also in uh, these uh splashdowns will be recorded for not just the people that is not able to join but also this is going to be published also in the in the website as is foreseen and um so yeah so therefore i'm gonna um like the recording is ongoing right now uh so so yeah um we have today for our first edition with a top with the topic nbs innovations in water in wastewater treatment and global a uh, global exchange um two of our uh, partners in the multi-source project we have a uh, Mireille martins uh, she's a project manager at the SME Richland, uh, where she's working in a design and construction and aerated air wetland uh, to treat various waste, wastewater, domestic agriculture, and industrial and uh, the countryside and in urban areas. She's also a lecturer in the HC University of Applied Sciences um, in the Water Technology Research Group. Um, in how to use wetlands or other NBS to treat various wastewater, agriculture, and industrial uh, from industrial sources as well. And our second uh, speaker today is Adir Pillay. Uh, he's a research manager in the Water Research Commission in South Africa. Uh, he's also a member of the International Advisory Board in the Multisource Project. Um, he's an expert in sanitation and sustainable urban water, decentralized waste water treatment, and he's also responsible for the strategic uh, molding of the non sewage uh, sanitation RDA portfolio. So thanks very much for accepting to be the first speakers of this first edition. So um, yeah, I will give the floor uh, first to Mireille. So the floor is yours. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Um, let's first share my screen. That works. Um, all right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah, OK, thank you, because I cannot see you anymore. Anyway, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as uh, uh, explained by Laura, I am uh, Mireille Martes, and I will explain to you today um, the perspective of uh, SME, so small uh, companies um, on implementing uh, nature-based solutions. Actually, more the, the barriers where we uh, which we encounter during our projects. So this is a picture of our project. Um, so we design and build uh, treatment wetlands. Um, uh, so um, I'll I'll tell the story um, uh, by using different projects we realized or oh, we didn't. Maybe a short introduction on uh, Reedland. Reedland is a company uh, which was founded in 1995 um, by Dion. Dion van Oerschot also present today. Um, and I so also work half time for uh, Rietland. The work field of Rietland is Belgium and the Netherlands, uh, so neighboring countries. And we have installed um, a little bit more than 300 treatment wetlands uh, um, in these past 30 years. Uh, and the focus is definitely on uh, domestic wastewater, uh, also the food and beverage in industry and uh, agriculture. Uh, if you talk about agriculture, it's more on the manure um, treatment, uh, but that's well, that's that's not the majority of the work. The majority is on uh, domestic wastewater, and that's uh, also the topic of today, more or less. Um, as a background, um, first of all, the good news the good news is that there's um, currently a growing interest in uh, nature-based solutions and we are very happy with that um we don't know because of what but we also think that the, the covid uh, pandemic had to do anything with uh, something with that uh, because a lot of people were um 
staying at home for a longer time and they rediscovered nature. So green, green is not so bad to have in the neighborhood. So maybe that has something to do with it. Uh, but in back in the days, um, green pioneers were uh, uh, an interesting group to work with. They were not so much focused on economics, but more on um, uh, uh, creating a better world and uh, using uh, nature for that. Another group of people who wanted to uh, buy uh, treatment wetlands were uh, companies in general, which were... Um, uh, which needed a permit, so uh, and it was mandatory for them to to get a treatment. and And one of the options is then to create a, to have a nature based solution, so a treatment wetland, but it could also be a, a different technology. And then economics is also a very good incentive to do anything. So um, uh, the the benefit of a nature based solution to not um, um, uh, uh, if it, people want to take a nature-based solution, the benefit of that is that the operation costs and the maintenance costs are much lower compared to uh, um, an order or a more common technology. So if that was um, a very important issue, then uh, a treatment wetland would be a, a good advice. Uh, another thing is that... Um, this is a project actually we did for a, a fruit company. So they they discharged um, the the wastewater from pears and and apples and so on into the ditch, and they had to pay a certain tax for that. Um, and we calculated that by uh, treating that wastewater uh, with a wetland, the return on investment was five years. So that's what they did. So. Uh, everybody happy, Econom uh, very good uh, economical deal, one and two. Uh, the ditch was very happy as well. I think the small animals there as well. Okay, so let's move further to the barriers. Um, so we, I'll, I'll explain uh, four of the barriers we encounter by using some projects. Uh, and the first is regulation. So... Um, Regulation in general um, cannot correspond or respond quickly enough to change, and in this case, climate change. And I would like to focus on the reuse and the infiltration. So in, in times of drought, it's good to reuse water. So first to treat uh, the water, the wastewater, and then to reuse it. Or uh, if not, you can infiltrate it in the groundwater. Okay, this is an example in Belgium. Uh, this is an off-grid campsite, the picture on the right side. Um, probably you're looking for reeds and the wetland. Well, this is a, um, a bizarre project we did. The wetland is beneath the, the gravel, the grey gravel. Why is that? Because this is uh, the campsite is located in the west of Belgium, which was World War I area. And so Actually, it's not allowed to dig in the ground because everything is uh, archaeological heritage. So that's why we had to build it in the shed. And as there is no rainwater, no um, uh, sunlight as well, we have chosen for uh, uh, gravel instead of grass in this, in this case. Um, but what I wanted to focus on is that uh, we have... Um, different streams of uh, wastewater here. We have the gray water, which is um, the, the from the showers and the sinks and so on. So that water is treated and is reused on the campsite in the, in the toilets, so for, for toilet flushing. Uh, and then it goes to the, through the toilets, it's treated again. That water cannot be infiltrated in Belgium. So it can be reused for toilet uh, flushing, but not for, for infiltration. In the Netherlands, we also did an ex uh, um, a project, and it's exactly the opposite. So in the Netherlands, we also treat the grey water, but that cannot be used for toilet flushing, but it can be used for infiltration. So this is another project. You see the on the on the right side, high apartment blocks 
They are from the 60s. They are demolished, but on the site itself is uh, recycled. And in the upcoming years, 130 um, um, small houses are, will be built with, with that material. But so the, the grey water infrastructure, so to treat the grey water is already present, which is this uh, reed, um, this wetland. Um, another barrier, uh, and it states economic advantages, uh, does uh, not end up with the investor of the project. And um, this is a, a picture of Holiday Park, which uh, we realized, the, the, the wetland over there. But I wanted to talk to you about the Holiday Park that didn't go ahead, or the wetland. Why is that? Because the owner or the investor, um, uh, yeah, uh, looked at his budget. He was he was owner of the budget, and and to to create the sewer system was much more, um, was much cheaper than creating a wetland. But if you create a wetland, you could reuse the water. So, um, but the owner or the investor was not the operator. So the benefits in the long term of using less energy, less water, whatever, is the benefit of the operator, but they're not deciding what is built because that's done by the investor. So there is, uh, there's a mismatch. So, and another thing is that in general, um, the nature-based solutions are at the end of a construction. So if you want to have a green roof, there should be already a roof or a green wall, there should be a wall or a wetland, then the pipe should be there. Yeah, so that's actually created at the end of a construction site or the process. Um, and at the end, there's never budget. So it's very important to 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 um, to be careful about that and to be uh, at the drawing table well or and to go through the process with all these different stakeholders. So it is the investor and the operator. They all should say have a saying and not only the the budget keeper. Uh, moving forward to governments, um, I'll use uh, Belgium. As a as an example, so uh, eighty six percent of the of the households in Belgium are connected to the sewer system, which means fourteen percent is not. Actually, the easy eighty six percent is connected, and the difficult fourteen is not, because they are located a little bit more remotely. And as you can see on the picture, all the dashed areas in green and uh, orange, they are a central area or are more easy to, to create a sewer system and a wastewater treatment and so on. So um, if you look at the more decentralized systems, well, it's, they're more expensive than, um, than the ones you can group. Uh, there's a long procedure for permits. Uh, actually, the municipalities have to organize it themselves. They have not the knowledge to do so. Um, and they're only a short time. Uh, so the mayor is, is elected in Belgium every six years. Um, so there's a lot of change. So the, 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 they have a short term vision more. And it's not their priority because it's, it becomes their priority if there, there's a lot of pressure of the, of the population. But in general, there's not. Uh, and they have no economic incentive. So um, it is already years that we... Or we have to do, or in Belgium they have to do so, but something about that 14%, but nothing happens. Um, last but not least, um, this is the complete opposite of the governments. So, and I use this this project of DAO we did together. So DAO is a international, well, it's an American uh, chemical industry. Um, and they are really dependent on water. So uh, they even have, in this DAO is located in Terneuze, which is the south of the Netherlands, and they have a pipeline of more than 100 kilometers to get their fresh water from somewhere, somewhere else, because they're located in a water-scarce region, and there's a lot of salt water in the, 
in the region. So they have to get the water from somewhere else. But the drinking water company said years back, well, I think they even said it before 2018, when it was really a dry summer uh, in Belgium and the Netherlands, um, that they, the, they could get cut off from that pipeline um, because of the, the, the water scarce region and there would not be sufficient amount of drinking water from the, for the households. So that's, that is why Dow has a really long time, long term vision on how to cope with water. So now they are, um, they are, they run different pilots on how to treat local water. So they use not the groundwater or the surface water, but they use the wastewater of their own facility. They use the wastewater of the municipality just around the corner and the rainwater, which falls in the vicinity of the, of the area. And then they treat it up to a certain quality that meets the standards for their process. And one of the different steps is the wetland. So that's why you see a green spot in an industrial area, which is always nice. Um, and actually it's the same a uh, little bit north. Uh, it's in the province of Flevoland in, in the Netherlands. Um, future um, industry will only get water from the water company at a, at a good water quality, but only getting four cubes per hour, which is really, really, which is almost nothing. If you really need water for production, you really have a problem. So even there's like this airport uh, development where we collaborate with. And um, that's also the same idea. So the, the wetlands will treat the water and there will be another treatment after that. And then the water will be reused in, uh, in sprinklers uh, as a uh, 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 firefighting uh, water. Uh, so that, that, that's the idea, so to reuse uh, water. So to conclude, there's a growing interest in nature-based solution, and we are very happy with that. Uh, for us, as a small company, it's very hard to talk to uh, governments, um, first of all, because of regulation, and that uh, takes some time. But otherwise, it's a very difficult client to uh, persuade. Um, so we, we prefer working with companies or with uh, people who, because they have a long-term vision and they're they're uh, quick in taking or yeah, faster in taking action. And for us, it's very important to be at the drawing table from the beginning and to have an eye on the process that we are not kicked out in between. Um, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Mireille. Uh, this is very, very, very interesting. Like to see these perspectives uh, from 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 your company, and also to realize what are the challenges um, that you face, or these kind of um, companies, and also including NBS solutions is kind of hard. Um, also happy to hear that you perceive as a improvement in the perception of how NBS is uh, taken from from the clients and from from the community in general. So we are gonna uh, discuss after the next presentation. Uh, we are gonna open the floor for everybody, uh, but for the moment I give the floor to Sudhir. So the floor is, the floor is yours. Hi everyone. Hope you're doing well. Sorry, my voice is a bit uh, bad at the moment. I have the flu. Uh, so I'm just give you a bit of a different perspective and it's a developing country perspective. And you'll see the contrast between high tech or, you know, almost like how you will have in, in European or Western worlds uh, to more low techs. And so we'll see this development as you go through. So I'm just going to focus on a few things. A lot of these examples come from South Africa. But scaling has been challenging because because just like the examples presented before me, you have some conservative engineering sector. You know, you must make business sense and policy and regulatory uh, challenges are there and how we overcome some of these things. And some of these, a uh, lot of the regulations tend to focus on disposal, not reuse. I'm talking from national perspective. Now, if you have a look at that picture, that is not two different pictures. It's actually one over aerial picture. So 
like most developing countries, it's an area of contrast. You know, you can see the big houses on your left. They probably have swimming pools. And just across the highway, you'll see people living in very informal tin type of houses. There's no municipality that has 100% sewage coverage. So within a city, you can have high rise residential buildings, high density, informal settlements, residential estates, and new development outside the city core, which could be government sponsored. Now, you have a look at this uh, this specific example. You can see some of the tent houses versus the some of the very scenic and tourist areas. So it's quite contrasting and, and our infrastructure actually mirrors the development of that. So on your left, you might find full sewage coverage. Everyone's connected to a flush toilet. But on your right, you know, there's difficulties even to lay pipes in those areas is very difficult. Like how would you formalize piping arrangements in that type of area? So we have different coverage of different solutions. I'm not going to go too much into this, but this is a lot of the non sewage type of stuff that we have. And um, I'm just giving you an example of some of the challenges we had. You see, we had a history of apartheid policy in South Africa. It's created a bit of in a lot of inequity uh, around the country. And to deal with inequity, some of the major cities took on some of the more rural households. And so you can see one of the municipalities, which is Durban of City, Durban, uh, city of Durban as its core, its boundaries in increased to 68% since 2000, right? And they had to provide additional 63,000 households with water and sanitation. So initially, with the red spots are, they said, you know what, we'll connect everyone to the sewer system, but outside those red spots, we're going to go for more dry solutions. And the reason we go for dry solutions is because Africa is a very dry country. Um, in about six to 10 years, we're going to run out of our supply. Our demands are going to exceed our supply on a national level. Uh, while west coast of a country is going to be almost desert-like. So uh, we don't have enough water. And, and when they calculated the capex just for the reticulated system, or just this one area of city, it was about 3 billion euro. And that's excluding uh, the HR getting new water just to put in a, a additional uh, sewage systems. Uh, I was a student in one of these systems and we looked at baffled reactors. It's basically a, 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 a compartmentalized septic tank. Uh, you know, it's for people that want a flushing toilet because in South Africa, because of this this background we come from, people uh, do not want a dry sanitation toilet. They want what the other people are, are more people who have a high income have and usually a flush toilet so a flush toilet is a gold standard so you can't have uh dry or toilets associated with the poor and toilets associated with other people and so we looked at different types of systems which you can have these decentralized systems and one of them was a baffle system um at its core um, these d watts we call them d watts so it's decentralized wastewater treatment systems that have been applied elsewhere we formed partnerships with a lot of these uh, organizations. One of them was Border. Uh, some of your pictures are from Indonesia and India and from Zambia. There's a couple hundreds of these plants available, but there wasn't any performance uh, assessment to see how do they, do, do they perform. Uh, you know, I worked with one of the PhD students uh, that did this. He looked at 180 watts plants in Indonesia, according to their discharge standard. Uh, on the right is the table for the percentage to compliance to discharge standards. So we had a look at some of these things. We decided if we move from the lab scale and with the help of border, we would put in a technical demonstration plant with the municipality. This is one of the areas. Uh, it had medium strength domestic wastewater, so around 500 milligrams COD. A lot of the wastewater was used in agricultural trials, so they want to look at not only the effects on the plants and the crops, but also on the soil. If you keep up pumping uh, chilled wastewater with nutrients in it, the soil, it will change its pH levels. Okay, so we have to look at some of the buildup over time. This has been ongoing for over 10 years at the moment. Our own experience, sometimes the technical doesn't match the reality on site. Now, this is at the front, at the head of the works. We didn't put a screen in. Okay, so it was 80 households, but we're finding bed bags and trash 
You can see there's condoms. There's even a little basketball you can see at the bottom. Right, we're getting a lot of trash, hydraulic overloadings, illegal connections, high fog content. And you know, we, we did smoke tests to, to, to stop some of the illegal connections, but more kept on popping up. Um, you know, so this was from the pre treatment step. So we learned a lot of lessons by doing uh, technical demonstrations. So we move from the lab, we say, okay, we understand it from a laboratory, from a very controlled environment. We put it in a pilot at the wastewater works. Then we move to a more technical, you know, connected in a real world environment to figure out some of these issues. Okay. These are not really purely on a performance on a technical performance, but it's more on, you know, once you combine technology and people, there are different types of variables that come into it. We kind of figured out and we sorted that out. We we put storm water overflows and those type of things to prevent some of these, uh, put a grid at the top. Uh, and we were about to go to to scale, and we were supposed to put a flushing urine diversion toilet in one, in the same city, in the same area. But a series of other challenges started popping up, and these are not technical issues. Okay, so it's also, like the previous speaker mentioned, some political issues that came stalled. You know, first it was supposed to be between 400 and 600 our households, and then I think more people want to connect to the system. Uh, at the moment, we decided, uh, and the municipality spoke to us, and they said, you know what, let's just go small at the moment, but 40 households. One of the challenges also was why we wanted the system is because the works was currently overloaded. So in this area, your wastewater plant couldn't handle more capacity. And so it was to treat a lot of this wastewater before it reaches the head of works to, to the, the centralized system. So have a lot of these decentralized plants here. Just a nice example for you guys to see. This is called the Arum Lu, and it's one of the first projects I got to manage at the W. So it's really fun. But if you look at the blue inside, you can see it's almost like an egg shape. Okay, uh, that specific shape and vortex was co copied from the Arum Lily, which is a plant, and you'll be able to flush your stools with two two liters of water with the specific toilet. And the good thing is, when you have don't have enough water supply. OK, in a lot of dry countries, you might run out of water for flushing. What are you going to do? The nice thing about this toilet is that the, within the system, you can hold two to three flushes, so you can flush multiple times. And a family household in a very urbanized area where you have a family and don't have water. This is a reality. You know, you flush once with six or two to nine liters. It's gone. You have to find more water. Uh, this is a great thing about having a toilet that flushes on less water. Just some information on how it works. So it copied the Aram Lily and, and the, uh, the dynamics of that and on how it moves on the airflow. Um, and it was used in the design of the actual pedestal. So from the outside, people want a flush toilet. It looks very much like a flush toilet. You wouldn't even notice. But the, the, the actual interior bowl has been designed for more hydraulic efficiency. And we put in some of these solutions uh, in very rural type of areas where you could reuse a lot of the water. Uh, we just tested to specific standards and most of the requirements were met. Uh, so you combine the, 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 the roof water harvesting potential, some of the treatment on the gray water system and some of the storage, and you have a balance of water that's available in these very rural areas where there's not much water available. There's no pipe water. And maybe sometimes boreholes are not available. Uh, interesting project. I think this was done with UFZ also. Um, uh, and so it was a grey water in, in settlements. And so they put in some of these, these systems in. The interesting part was more on the design. People didn't want to stoop low to wash their clothes. They wanted the thing, the basin a bit higher. But when they put a higher basin, more people use it and the filters get clogged up uh, quite quicker. So I think from a developing country perspective, you know, some of our grey water can be about about 1,000, 2,000 milligrams COD per litre. So it's almost like hydrogen domestic wastewater. It will have high fecal coliforms, high E. coli. Um, as you've seen in some of our examples, the pre-treatment step for some of these areas, because this water is so limited, it's very highly concentrated. It's not like using 90 litres to wash all your clothes. You're probably using 2 litres, 3 litres. And so the pre-treatment step for a lot of these uh, developing country contexts where there isn't much water, 
you can't not dilute your problem away. You need a good strong pretreatment step. So even an anaerobic system probably would work in this case. These are other examples. Some black soldier fly larvae, they're not a pest. Uh, we've done some projects in Uganda and we had one of the biggest plant treating uh, sewage waste. Um, so it basically has a limited cycle. Some of that was used for oils or for, for biochars. But I think when it comes to the business sense, it needs to make business sense, right? So uh, most of the cost comes from transporting sludge, which is a challenge. And, you know, really relating to, to some of the challenges, you sometimes to, you have to de-risk the risk of diversion. I mean, on your left, you'll see one of the first plants developed uh, wastewater to tap in the world was the Vinto plant. And the current organization I was working with was one of the ones that financially backed a lot of this and did a lot of tests uh, somewhere because South Africa and Namibia was used to be called Southwest Africa and used to be a colony of South Africa a long time ago. And so a lot of the research that was continued between where I'm working now, Pretoria and Namibia was carrying on. Uh, and the importance of doing some of these testings, you know, we have established a, a water technology demonstration program. So it's pre-commercialization. So you can see we, we, you know, I had a portfolio where we were making bricks from P, collected P. We looked at some of the business decision, does it make financial viability to collect this? How much does it cost? Uh, we also have a commercialization aspect where if you have a TR level eight or nine, we are putting a lot of this and we're bridging the gap between the policy, the regulation, the standards, and we're bringing all of this together because we realize from a research organization, it's it's hard for us to do, you know, stop here. And the challenge comes at the back end of the pipe is how do we move to this uh, regulatory policy environment? So just some summary, some of the nature based solutions offer circularity principles, which are good. But for you to take off, the business case must make sense. Uh, pilots and demo at local lives level, as I've shown you, ends are potential implementation as of, uh, issues. So what, what might work well in India, or in Indonesia, or even Thailand, it needs to be tested in a South African environment or whatever country you're bringing it to figure out whether it works the same. Sometimes our regulations don't even match. Uh, sometimes when you're reusing a recycle, it beyond, goes beyond the water regulator. It's sitting in someone else's uh, department. So, and finally, in the developing world, you need good pre-treatment steps. So, digital tests and ingress, good way to run this is community campaigns. And you must design for, for high peak loads and high strength wastewater, including very water. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, Sudhi, for, for this presentation. It's very, very, very insightful. Um, and and it's very, very interesting how all these challenges as well, um, like from your perspective and also from, from like, as you mentioned, the developing countries context um, brings also kind of like our, yeah, like the context for our different kind of water treatment um, solutions that we want to aim also with this project and also in another kind of initiatives. Um, so that leads me um, like to start the discussion uh, slot. Um, I will start uh, asking you both first the speakers and of course, please the, 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 the people that, is, that has joined us today, please raise your hands as well. Like that is the, this is the platform where we would like to have a more active um, uh, discussion between all of us, not just uh, the speakers and me, but also you as attendees. So I would like to ask uh, to both of you, like it comes from, from different spheres uh, within within the water management landscape. So, and looking at these um, challenges that you that you just mentioned before, how do you envision the inter interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary <laughs> collaboration um like to address these complexities of the water treatment like from from your perspectives how do you foresee that and if you have an example please please share with us really you like to go first? yeah I'll, I'll okay next next time is you <laughs> all right um it's a it's a good question um 
and I don't, of course, have not, no answer to that because um, if people talk about the complexity of wastewater, I don't see that. Um, wastewater is a problem and we can just solve it. And we started with that like long, long time ago in the 1850s. So I was I was thinking in the 1850s we had cholera uh, and, and wastewater was a way to get rid of it. So, uh, so we do it for human health. And and in London they got the big stink. <laughs> so if it's not if it stinks, then we also want to do something about it. Um, but then back in the days they also came up with because at this point we we have more or less the same things. We have the new um, micro pollutants where we have to come up with a solution, and they are carcinogenic. So it's again human. Uh, health and we we don't want eutrophic areas because that can also stink and does look like nice. So we have ex well the same jacket, but the uh, but all problems. Well, you know uh, what I'm getting at. So, um, but back in the days, they also resolved that, and I don't know how they did that. So maybe it is an interesting thing to go back into the 1800s because now we're looking at this. Uh, integral uh, approach. Uh, I don't know how they did that then. Um, uh, so, yeah, because everybody knows that there's a technology and we can solve it, but no, not everybody's on the same line or has a different perspective on that. And we are talking a lot about that, but I was just wondering, because it's not a new problem, it has been there all along and we have found already solutions in, in the past. Um, yeah, so actually I just added a question. I don't have the answer. No, that, that doesn't fair, fair, fair enough. So if someone wants to answer this question, this also please, please go ahead. But indeed that I think most of us or people in, in, in this branch are engineers and sometimes we stick with some like references technologies. But but yeah, as you mentioned, like the, the aim of those water treatments in the, in our in our in our context is like to find the solutions for those problems now like and the the one that i that i think one aspect that we need to integrate is also like to speak with other um di disciplines and for example as sudir was mentioned like to involve the social aspect as well because otherwise the technologies that we develop maybe doesn't match with the reality now so maybe maybe that's one thing that we can we can we can develop uh, further. So, so there you wanted to, to to say something before. Yeah, I think it's needed. It, it, it's a. I think when you're designing solutions for people, you have to consider the people. Technical is easy to sort out. Uh, it's really easy to sort out. If you ask me to put in a technical solution, I'll give you one. And we've been through this journey because we have a quite an unequal society in South Africa. Uh, and I showed you some of these pictures. Is that you know, we were giving people latrine or dry toilets, but it's difficult because people have an aspiration for flush toilets, although we don't have enough water in the country to flush everywhere. So and I think this is a great thing also about living here yeah, is that you challenge to come up with a solution. You constantly challenge to, to engineer your solution. So this is where we move into, OK, people want a flush toilet. We got that from the social studies also. It was big social studies, maybe 80,000 people, something like that. Big studies we do after that. Um, and we found out that people want to, to aspire for a flush toilet. But so the other option was, OK, we'll give you a low flush toilet. OK, and it's an off grid type of toilet, so it doesn't connect to a sewer. It doesn't uh, you know, impact some of the additional load to the plant. Um, those are some of the options we we be moving to, and and now some of our new solutions uh, focus on total recycling, and it's not only for poor people; it's even for myself. So even today, I was going to buy one of those toilets because I was stuck without water for seven days because, you know, the the reservoir was almost that finished. Okay, so even for me, uh, which I consider uh, quite a uh, I earn enough, I have a nice place, just like you guys in a very urbanized area. What do you do when you don't have water? And I think this is where 
we try and you know usually people don't listen until something catastrophic uh, starts and you know so you can tell people okay make a vaccine for this vaccine nothing happens until there's a pandemic or something comes up and you'll see more stuff directed so usually when there's a, a big water challenge then just like Marilla said when there's a color outbreak then you realize hey we need to do something with the sanitation so usually my strategy is to have some of these products to almost market ready or market ready or as a team have them market ready and available because when a catastrophe happens or when something happens at least you have enough supply of those things because one of the other issues is when you run out of water you don't have toilets or you don't have recycling is getting enough uh, supply your supply chain needs to be built up yes so indeed, it, indeed. It kind of cross cross cuts across the know you asked me on the interdisciplinary and I, but i had to connect it to some of the the economics and and the current conditions uh it's based on your current conditions the people and the technical together yeah, yeah, definitely. And I wanted to, yeah, Anna, please go ahead. Hi, hi, both, <laughs> everybody. So I've I've been wondering, Mireille, we had this conversation. Mm, I'm not sure it was this year, I think it was last year, actually. And you said that you kept on thinking of, you know, how to actually involve the society. But, you know, in your case, it's different because you actually are just providing solutions. I mean, you know. You have an issue, you have to solve it. But then I was thinking, you know, in case of, let's say, the the um, houses that then the investor decided not to go for a green solution. And then the other houses that you said that in, in, I don't know, year's time, they're going to be, I don't know how many, 130 houses built there. I mean, there is always the possibility, you know, of actually going beyond, uh, no, there is an issue and I need to solve it, you know? But the question is, how are we used to doing things? So if actually people were, you know, asked, you know, if we had more of a practice of actually including, you know, people and societies into the, the process, then maybe there would also be more pressure or on the investor, or I'm not sure, even maybe from, from the, I mean, you know, this is like a long-term thinking, yeah? But, you know, on how to actually, from the municipality, because for them, it pays off in a sense, because, you know, but it's a question of what are the standard operating procedures? How are we used to doing things? And then the other thing that I was thinking about today is uh, the project that we have in Uganda. Mm, so it's in an area where there's, you know, the, the, there is no connection to the sewage system. So so when, you know, the toilets were built in, and they built like uh, eco so or eco toilets that obviously have no, no water. I mean, they're not connected to water and the, the solid and the urine is, is you know, um, separated and then actually even though we we knew that there were there could be potential issues um with awareness raising because you know there's still prejudice about this there was a lot of sensitization and you know from the fr from the mayor you know there was like a huge campaign and whatnot but actually we did an evaluation now of the project and it turns out that people still actually are really not that keen on using them so it's a solution that it's better for them also because they have water next to it, let's say for women to clean, you know, wash their hands or if they have their periods, they can, you know, wash the pads or, you know, empty the menstrual cups, but they're still reluctant to use it. So, so I mean, there's so, uh, so many aspects that are so complex that I'm not sure that um, we even think about them. And even if we do, you know, how to change our ways of doing things. So, yeah. So, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's true. It's true. We have a certain way of doing things, and we should rethink that. Uh, to give an example, there's quite a big difference between Belgium and the Netherlands how you build a, a house. In the Netherlands, in average, you don't build your, your own house. There is like a, a big promoter who builds like a neighborhood. And if he wants to build a neighborhood, then there's all these stakeholders involved. Um, and then you can be on the table and to think about the broader perspective and so on. In Belgium, in general, you build your own house. So there's only one stakeholder, the owner, 
And, um, and what does it do? It just looks at the regulation. All right, in Belgium, it is obliged to put a, a rain uh, tank and to reuse the rainwater um, and to use it for flushing toilets. In the Netherlands, that's not obliged. They have a different regulation. But so every country is so specific. And, and I can imagine that there could be like a more or less a good framework how to implement as much nature-based solutions in a good way. But then you, yeah, every country has to adapt their way of thinking in, uh, in, in more in that framework then. Yeah, Elena, please. Or Anna first. No, Anna first, then Elena, and then Sudir. <laughs> oh, Elena, then. <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot also uh, for this very, uh, very interesting discussion. Also, like bringing it down to the technicalities, which sometimes is also important to, to start uh, talking uh, from that scale. Um, I just wanted to, like, as a reflection also uh, over these days that we are uh, reflecting a bit on the stakeholder engagement activities from, from Multisource, and it is exactly very important that we, we tailor this engagement, right? It doesn't mean that because, for example, that works, as Mireille mentioned, in, uh, in the Netherlands, that would work, for example, in, in Belgium, since there is not even like the, the right group of stakeholders to, to do uh, such. So I think it is important always that we, we tailor this, uh, this engagement to, to the needs also of, of each project, right? And how we would like to, to approach uh, the, different, uh, the different stakeholders, which sometimes it's also difficult to, uh, to have them on the table. Mireille mentioned before that they don't work with the with the government because it's a difficult client to to work or it's not fast enough to to uptake these solutions, and also that links a bit to to what Sudir mentioned before, right? That um, it is important that all these uh, solutions are somehow integrated, but we always take into consideration the reality check. So what's happening with the governance uh, aspects or the economic aspects and what is feasible in the end to 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 bring this um, together? So I, I was wondering also from from your own um, experience to to both of you, how could then we make sure that we uh, we share this technology, but it is also um, feasible from from the other uh, stakeholders to to uptake such solutions, and who would that be, right? Maybe today you also want to, to react to that since you're the next. Ah, okay, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think for the first question was, you know, how do we get it scaled up? You know, uh, just uh, from the last multi-source multi -source meeting, I've actually been speaking to Paula a lot uh, from uh, San Francisco. Uh, it's kind of the same trajectory I, uh, that I believe in. Uh, I don't know if my whole organization believes in, but in San Francisco is very similar in terms of water to South Africa, uh, limited. So in these very limited uh, resource areas like Singapore, like Ventook, you'll find the update of technology quite quick, quite, moves quite fast, right? Uh, compared to other places, but we, my plan is to have it as a national thing. Just like how San Francisco said, okay, for any new development, we tested it, we piloted, it works well, we worked out the risk, and they kept on increasing. So any new residential area has to have a new type of system, a recycling system. And I think that's the, probably the trajectory that we want to go. Um, but your other question, Elena, yeah, I mean, uh, this is basically what we also trying to do at, at the same time, but I think, what we don't want to do is end up a scenario, and usually humans are very late to learn, where we run out of water first and then start putting unregulated solutions. And, and unfortunately, that's usually what happens everywhere in the world. 
but we want to be a bit more forward thinking and saying, OK, let's have make let's make provisions uh, for the regulations. Now we can have it at a national level. So if in case something does happen, or at least from my level, we can build up enough technology base uh, where we can have the risk aversion removed for, 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 for a lot of the stuff available. I don't know if that makes sense to, you know, and the rest of the game. You know, no, indeed, indeed, it it um it resonates as well, like very much with 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 myself and with the background that I have as well. Um, I come also from uh, a developing country. I come from Colombia, and uh, we have the opposite kind of sometimes. Like our like we have like a lot of so water sources, uh, but also these water sources depend on uh, like the energy depend on these water sources. But then El Nino comes. And then, then we have the the these 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 issues, and then everyone is saying, "Oh, now we don't have water, but if we don't have water, we won't have energy as well." So that is double risk. And then it's like the the then come like the authorities, and then it's like, "Okay, what is the solution that we want to find? Like, what is the solution really?" And then yeah, as we were mentioning also like before, when we are in this context of okay, now now what 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 we are gonna do? Then comes like the the asking for solution and we have to act now. But the prevention sometimes is like hmm, hard to find. Mireille. Yeah, so uh, thank you. So, so do you answer the question on uh, how people in London act so fast to get a sewer system because that was a new invention in 1815 because there was a big catastrophe so people wait for the biggest catastrophe and then they they, they start working. Um, um, so um, in I, I would like to answer on uh, Elena's question. Um, I, as a small company, you don't have such a good overview of all the stakeholders and you're not so in contact with all of them. The, that's not our place as well. But we, we have a lot of contact with a lot of uh, different uh, people in different companies and, and regulations and uh, as well. Um, to give you an example, in, in the Netherlands, they use water boards, so they are responsible for different regions. And um, But there is also very dependent on who you talk to in the water board, because depending on which person you talk to, they're very in favor of nature-based solutions or not. So it also depends just on the person on specific spot but when that person really is eager to work with you then it really you can make big steps as well so that's also the the positive side of it um and then in belgium we we talk there is like this institute they call it's called flaqua uh which is kind of a network organization and experts organization they only seven people but they know so much about water and who to connect to who um and they are like a spider in the web um, and they're very, very, they know everybody, so they can connect a lot of people. And, and by having this, we don't have to have our, uh, such a good image about stakeholders because they have and they connect everybody. So that is really, really a valuable organization. Just a very quick reaction to that. I, I also agree that it's important that we take the message forward, right? And even if we are not the one to, to engage with a, a more a bigger group of, of stakeholders, we just ensure that this message goes beyond, right? Or the same goes for the local authorities, that it depends a lot on which department you, you talk to, but then it's important that this person can uptake it and take it further within and spread the, the message within their, their department. Sorry, I know, Laura, you're running out of time, but I think one of the important things when I'm speaking to uh, Paula, because a lot of the questions on me trying to implement, I was asking Paula. So, you know, a lot of companies or, or water boards or municipalities, they it's a tariff issue also. If you start recycling water and use it, that's how they make revenue. So I was asking her these questions, how did you overcome this? How did you overcome that? You know, and she, and she was providing, okay, this is what we had to do. This is what we had to do, you know, because it's also a, a tariffing and a revenue issue. And I think that was important to have that type of discussion. 
and who operates and maintains that solution. Uh, and she, she even gave the financials for that. So I thought that was very helpful. So, so multi-source has been beneficial this cross learning. That's that's the idea. That's the idea, and that's that's great to hear as well. Um, well, actually, that that is very 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 good point. And actually, um, I just wanted before we close the 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 the, the splashdown session. Um, first of all, thanks a lot for 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 um, our both speakers, Mireille and Sudhir and also for the active particip participation and uh, we are going to have the next edition uh, with Paula actually actually uh, she's going to join us as speaker next next uh, splashdown with uh, the professor Maria Maria Elisa Magri from the Universidad Federal de Santa Catarina uh, the one in Brazil uh, so we are going to talk about um, about the uh, pat the research on pathogens and water reuse, so this match actually kind of like the, is the open window for matching the other splashdown series. We are uh, inviting you as well. You will receive the invitation as well. This uh, recording will be posted as well for the people who uh, were not able to join this time, and we'll keep you posted with the next editions. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Bye bye.